Anyhow, hi everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to, and th thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Hamilton uh, Jewish Federation and the Westdale Theater. Um, as you may have known and you've been following, we're going to be talking about three different wonderful films this week. This, uh, this film festival was originally going to be happening live at the Westdale Theater, but unfortunately because of the pandemic, we had to, of course, uh, close and uh, postpone this. I think it was originally gonna be in May, April or May, is that right, Wendy? March. March, anyhow. So instead we've decided, let's still share the films with all of you, give you a chance to see these wonderful films. And then instead of doing a Q and A at the theater, we're doing the Q and A uh, as part of these Zoom webinars. And uh, one of the wonderful things about that is that we will be able to, um, people can see these films who are not in Hamilton and able to come to the theater. And also we can have participants come and join us for these uh, Q and A's after. Unfortunately for this film, the, the director of the film, Avi Nesher, lives in Israel. So I think it must be about three in the morning right now there. So he's not able to join us, but instead we have two of the people from the Jewish Federation who were instrumental in making all of this happen. And Wendy and Benson will be joining up me for this conversation to talk about this wonderful film and also to answer questions you might have about the film. So there is a QA. and a uh, You can see there's chat, but there's also something called Q&A. And Q&A is probably the best way for you to ask us questions or make comments about the film. And Wendy will be monitoring the Q&A and bringing in your questions for us to discuss at the appropriate time. And, um, and one of the things I, I'm just gonna put it out there because I'd be curious, maybe people do wanna comment, is what, what do they think the uh, Avi meant by the title, The Other Story? Because there are so many different characters, there are a lot of stories going on in the film. I know what I think he might have meant and why he chose that title, but I'd be curious to hear from all of you. So that's something you might be able to be thinking about. And after we've done some discussion, we'll be getting to the questions. And if that's something that interests you, I'd love to hear your thoughts about why he selected this. Now, for those of about yeah. Avi Nesher, he is probably one of the most accomplished Israeli filmmakers there are. He's made, I think this was his 18th feature film. So clearly, as you can tell, watching the film, we're in the hands of a very sophisticated and experienced director. And, and he really has managed to create a very compelling story, in, in my opinion. Uh, it, it's, it's an original screenplay, though interestingly enough, it was written with the help of Dr. Noem Schuponser, I hope I'm not saying that name too wrong, who is a psychology professor in Israel and who has written in great length about the conflicts between secular and religious Judaism in Israel. So um, you can certainly see, and I certainly felt, the authenticity behind this story and behind these characters. This was something that obviously had been researched, had been thought about a lot, and they went to a, a great effort to present these characters in a, in a very kind of a realistic, may I say, way. Um, as, and these are, of course, people who really understand the issues and challenges that exist in Israel today. Um, personally, I also found it quite refreshing to see an Israeli film that absolutely did not discuss at all the Palestinian question. So many of the current films do and are focused on that. And, and of course, you know, a very worthwhile subject for films to be about. But it was quite interesting in a way that this film absolutely never touched on it in barely any way. I mean, there's the little visit to, you know, to, to, to the Palestinian area where they go to the, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the church or the nun, nunnery or where they go. But um, I thought that was very refreshing. But to start, why don't we talk a little bit, and I know, Wendy, you know quite a bit about Avi Nesher and, and his background and, and his, his work in, in film, because I always think it's good for audiences to know the context of who the filmmaker is and what they've done in the past to help understand what they've tried to do in this film. Do you want to talk a little bit about Avi? Sure. 
So as you said, Fred, Avi Nesher is one of Israel's most influential and celebrated filmmakers. He, he writes the screenplays for all his films in addition to directing them. So Avi Nesher was born um, in the 50s in Ramat Gan in Israel. And when he was 12 years old, his family moved to New York. His father was a diplomat, diplomat and his parents were both Holocaust survivors. And this is important to know when we look at his later films. So he spent his adolescence um, in New York, went to high school there, and then um, he entered Columbia when he was 16, but then he interrupted his education to go back to Israel to serve in the army. And he served two years with uh, Sayeret Matzkal, which is a very elite combat unit, and then two years in intelligence um, before returning to, um, to the States to complete his education. He majored in filmmaking at Columbia University. Now he made his first film in 1978 at the age of 24. And that film is considered today still one of um, Israel's most, um, it's considered a classic, it's a cult film and it was called The Troop. Um, and it was basically about um, an Israeli entertainment uh, band and, and what they got up to. And, and the reason it was so revolutionary is he modeled it after Robert Altman's MASH. And, and it was quite subverse, subversive. It was made uh, after, the, after the Yom Kippur War when, when Israelis were really questioning um, their institutions. And uh, it was also made the same year that Anwar Sadat came to Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, that film was followed by um, Diesengoff 99, which also became a cult classic about um, three young people living on Diesengoff. And, and, and Avi Nesher's films have an autobiographical quality to them. You could say they're very personal because he's very passionate about um, his, his, his country, his society. And his films have a lot of insight. And over the last five decades, every film that he has made has really captured something essential about Israeli society. Now, um, he, he returned, one of the movies he made was called Rage and Glory about um, Lehi, which was um, a, a radical group uh, during the British mandate who, who were trying to bomb the British out of, out of Palestine. And that movie was noticed by um, a movie mogul in, in Hollywood, Dino De Laurentiis, who uh, reached out to Avi Nesher and asked him to come back to Hollywood, which he did. And all throughout the 90s, he was in Hollywood making B movies with up and coming actors. But then- uh, They weren't just people, he made, he made some pretty good movies, but it's interesting because they were very Hollywood type movies. He, he really went in a different direction for a while. Yeah. Correct. But then there was this life changing moment in 2001, his father died. And he had this feeling that of regret that he never really asked his father about his, his stories. His, his, his parents didn't really talk much about the Holocaust. So he came back to Israel. And in 2004, he made what might be his most one of his most famous films, because so many of his films are famous, but it's called um, Sofa Olam Smala, turn left at the end of the world. And that just took Israel by storm. And, and to this day, I think it's one of Israel's best-selling films. And it was mm -hmm. somehow he called it an ode to his father, even though it had nothing to do with the Holocaust. It was about immigrant communities living in, the, in a development town in the Negev, specifically uh, in immigrants from India and immigrants from Morocco. And um, after that, he he really left Hollywood and all his subsequent films were Israeli films made in Israel. And um, interestingly enough, many of them debuted in Toronto at the Toronto International Film Festival, beginning with The Secrets in 2007, um, followed by several others, including this movie here, The Other Story. Um, so, so really, you know, we, we are in the hands of a very experienced, masterful storyteller. And, and later on, we'll talk about some of his technique in terms of uh, cutting and, and camera work and, 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 and casting and, and, and how he, he managed to pull off this complicated story. I mean, 
you, you mentioned Robert Altman, or think of all the characters in this story that he's trying to juggle and get their stories and then interwine their stories. This is not very easy to do. But before we jump into more specifics, I thought it would be helpful because again, not knowing our audience and how sophisticated they are about Israeli culture and what's going on there today, I thought Benson, maybe you could help us by, you know, putting this story in perspective. You know, this story about the conflict between secular and religious Judaism, and then this phenomenon. And again, apologize if I'm saying it wrong. Hazarab Betshuva, right, which is this this phenomenon of large numbers of previously secular young Jews mm -hmm. returning to this extreme definition of faith. So tell us a little bit about where this is. Has this always been this way in Israel? Is this something new? What are the conflicts going on? Sure, I'll be glad to. Well, you know, I mean, Wendy mentioned Turn Left at the End of the World, and I consider that one of my favorite Israeli movies. And that movie is also not about the Palestinian event. It's about the issue of different sub-societies in Israel. And Israel's an immigrant country, and it's got people from all over. And what we see is something that outsiders often don't see. So visitors to Israel, people that are aware of Israel or, or, or have one view, either you know, supportive or, or have issues with some of the things that Israel does, usually tends to see it as a sort of a homogeneous country, more or less. And I think what, what Avi does so brilliantly is he, he breaks that down and shows us that it's anything but. That in fact, it's a, it's a aggregation of, it's even more varied than, you know, this great supposed American multi, uh, melting pot or, or salad bowl or whatever. You have a situation where not only do you have very radically different groups coming from different countries with different cultures that, that see the world in a very, very different way. You also have this growing, very, very strong divide in Israel between different notions of religiosity. So, you know, you know we're all, I'm, most people are familiar, they've seen pictures, they, they know in Brooklyn there are people that wear, you know, ultra-Orthodox, they wear black coats, they have a different a sort of a religious life. Um, in Israel, it's, 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 first of all, much more pointed. It's much more uh, in your face, partly because people are living side by side and have to exchange with each other uh, virtually everything, you know, the, the, their economic, their security, uh, so what you see are, are uh, you know, people in, a, in, there's a continuum always in religiosity everywhere we go, but in Israel, it's very distinct. So the secular is almost a religion in Israel. There are many people, I know many of my friends that would, for example, refuse to get married, even though they're a family and they have children, because they don't want to, uh, to intersect with the religious space. Hmm. Because the, 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 the feeling the, of separation, of anger, of frustration with religiosity and, and secular life in Israel can be that strong. And then, of course, you have people in different levels that continue. You have, you know, maybe uh, people that wear the kippah, the, 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 the kippah sugah. They're, they're more, they're practicing, but they're not, they're not um, like sort of the black coat people, right? So what this movie shows is, is um, how strong, how, how absolute, it's, it's like a, a, uh, almost like a nationalism to be secular or to be religious because the, the communication lines are very, very weak. They're, they almost don't see each other. They're, they pass each other by in a public space, but you have to realize they, they have a completely different uh, set of uh, community goals, and it could be, and they 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 see the political world and the economic world and the security world in very different ways. So there's a lot of frustration that comes out, and I think the the movie shows that. But I will add one thing, Fred, and that is this movie. Throughout the movie, you see the tension of the Palestinian conflict, but it's kind of noise. It's That's background right. noise. That's right. 
It's, it's, you know, it's on the radio. They, every time they go in the car, the radio is talking about, you know, major incidents. You hear it on the news broadcast. You hear it in the TV broadcast. You saw it when, you know, the, when they have the interaction with the uh, Arab kids in Jerusalem that, you know, it, it, it's there. So what it's saying, I think what he's saying is, yeah, this thing is happening all the time. And that noise is affecting everyone to a certain extent. And it's not maybe the dominant theme. The dominant theme is really the difference that people have in terms of their community goals. And, and for outsiders like us, that, that's a strange thing because we would think the major issue in Israel is the conflict, the Palestinian conflict. But actually it's not. There's the conflict between religiosity and secular uh, Israelis is much stronger than the conflict, you know, on day-to-day -day basis between Israelis and Palestinians. Yeah, that, that, that's really fascinating. And, and I think you're right. It, it, it really is um, a, a complex society that, you know, and, and, and a social setting that is very unique. I can't think of any other country that really has this much diversity and, 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 and challenges and, and to continue to pull together. And of course, they're doing it in this very adversarial situation to begin with, which um, maybe is part of why they're able to continue to be successful to some extent. What I particularly like, though, about how he told this story, because there are obviously a lot of different characters and storylines, and each character and storyline does, in a sense, illustrate a different kind of Israel, you know, a different kind of lifestyle that's going on there, but um, and a different connection to Jewish life and culture and practice. But none of these characters ever feel like symbolic to me. They always feel real that, you know, that that they're living a life, that they have an internal life that is that is driving them forward. And 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 although we may not get full insight into everything that's happening. They, they, it could very easily have become more symbolic and more of a message kind of movie. But again, this skilled director and also these wonderful performances prevent that from happening. Um, one of the things that I think is so wonderful and characteristic of this story, I, I, and, I, and I assume of Israeli culture is that everybody's in a hurry. Right. Everybody talks really fast. Everybody's in a hurry. The phone's ringing. It's not ringing. You know, you know how many different phone calls there are going on in this story? And, and in fact, sometimes there is so much of a hurry, they don't really even pause to look at each other. They're all very self-involved in their own story. And I wonder sometimes if they could have sat and listened they could have put aside some of the stereotypes and preconceptions they have, you know, about the other, and and, re and recognize they're all imperfect, you know, and and they're all trying to do some, you know, to be good. I don't think there's a, a villain in this movie. There's no, you know, there's no antagonist. They're they're all, you know, people trying to make this work, and uh, and that's sort of a, a neat kind of feeling that you start to get from the film is if we could ever, you know, put aside our assumptions and expectations, we might actually be able to get together a little long, you know, better, right? Uh, the cast is extraordinary. And some of them, I, I guess, are quite well known, though not to me. But obviously, the, 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 the father, the grandfather, who, uh, Shwomo Abadi, is Sasson Gabe, and who's a very well-known Israeli actor. We've seen him all the time. His son, uh, Yonatan Abade, is uh, Yuval Sigal, and I, he, I think he performs also in Western you know, culture, in, in maybe not Hollywood movies, but American movies. I thought his performance was, was absolutely terrific. You know, he, he's uh, certainly a very internalized character, but managed to really, you know, really bring across a lot of the depth and, and a lot of the complexities of this very flawed individual, obviously. And, and, and at the heart of this, of course, the reconciliation with his daughter is, is something very, you know, is one of the main themes of the, of the movie. And then, of course, Joy Rieger, who plays Anat, right? So I think this gal's going to be a big star. I gather she's actually done other movies. This might be, you know, one of her, her best, but a very complicated role. 
you know, obviously, because when we first meet her, we think this is who she is. We find out she wasn't this, that she, you know, she was living with her mother in that beautiful penthouse apartment that, you know, and that, you know, she, she, had, and then of course we see those crazy videos she did with, with her, you know, husband-to-be, Shahar. Incredible performance. And then of course, Shahar himself, you know, because as much as maybe there's a, you know, a not so or even more flawed character, you know, he's an actual big pop star in Israel. His name is Nathan Goshen. And, and Nathan, I, I just found him so charismatic and so interesting. And, and, and then watching him actually perform, you know, he is a singer that, you know, so had, uh, had, it, it, I found that just really interesting how they, and I don't think he's an actor. I don't think he's ever acted in anything. No, but, but there's, a bit was, of a, there's some autobiographical coincidental things in his life as well. So was that right? Yeah, he was raised by a single mom and uh, yeah. he was raised secular, but there was one point in his life where he turned religious. Huh. And um, and then he left and and he actually um, he wasn't an actor, but Avina Sher uh, cast him like he casts most of his actors based on who they are as people. Right. And he thinks that they're similar to the characters. And right. he was interviewed after the film and he said that really it touched him so deeply because he had lived that life and he had lived both in the secular and the religious world, just like the character that he portrayed. Fantastic, yeah. So, so really, really extraordinary, and and obviously, and, and you know, I mean, there's, there's just so much going on here because, of course, it, he sort of found this wonderful way of really having these two separate stories, family stories, right? Uh, you know, a not story is obviously the primary story, and then of course the story of um, of of uh, of the you know the the couple who are you know, looking at this potential divorce and Abigail Harari, you know, very great actress and, you know, involved in the cult. And, 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 and at first, you know, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Why is he opening up this second story if it's, or is it just for the purpose of having the father and the son have to work together? And it was quite fascinating how he was able to weave it in such a way that a knot becomes deeply involved in this B story, you know, and, and, and it all kind of winds up to, you know, making some sense together. Um, that, that really is sort of brilliant storytelling and it's a way of creating a lot of action. I was shocked that, you know, although this is a film because it doesn't really have action in it, it was, it was very fast paced. It was very, uh, it's partic particularly the beginning of the movie is very quickly edited, short scenes, moving you along, a lot of momentum going on. And, and really involving the audience in, 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 in the story, you, you, you can't help yourself because there's fascinating people and new, new situations coming up all the time. Um, you know, some people comment that, you know, there isn't sort of a clear resolution at the end of the film, that there's a little bit of a thematic murkiness to it, you know, that it's not, you know, there isn't one message you're really walking away with here in terms of what's right or wrong. But I actually think that's part of the genius of the film is that it's not trying to really, you know, say what's right or wrong. It's really allowing the audience to participate in, in, the, in, in the conversation, be able to watch the film. And you have to kind of make some of your own decisions about, you know, what you feel and what you think about the situation. So. I, I don't know. I thought that was brave because most films, you know, people want a better defined ending and a better, you know, more clarity about what's going to happen to everybody. I, I actually thought it was quite wonderful and, and sort of intelligent to leave it more open-ended. Um, very, very, very strong in that respect. Um, what about, uh, uh, we have some comments starting to come in, Wendy, so you'll introduce them. Now, the other thing that I thought was so interesting to me was that, you know, th there's almost a, a thriller element in this as well, right? You know, we, we, it's almost like a mystery story. We suddenly, you know, we've started off with this sort of domestic relationship story and suddenly we're moving into the semi-thriller territory, you know, where we're trying to, you know, we're going through the different neighborhoods and we're trying to, you know, to find, 
you know, where everybody is and, and figure out, you know, I, I was worried the whole cult thing was going to become, you know, this ugly, you know, kind of violent thing, which I don't particularly like in movies, but they managed to handle that, you know, in a very delicate and appropriate way, I thought. So, you know, again, uh, this is, it's just so interesting me to, 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 to see someone who can, can handle these very complicated kind of questions in, in a very appropriate way, you know. Um, but I'm, again, I'm really curious about any other thoughts people have about, you know, the other. And what about you guys, Wendy? Or do, do, uh, do we have anybody who's made any comments? Or Benson, do you want to yeah. comment on the you title know, what of they, the movie? What the I'd add about the mentioned? other is there, there was a lot of ideology portrayed in the film. Everyone was ideological in one in one way or another. So, uh, and I think that there's an argument saying that that ideology itself keeps you from being right or wrong. You you become you own that ideology. So, you know, I mean, the nuns were ideological. The 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 you know this uh, crazy you know made up religion was ideological. Of course, the religious was, and that was in terms of her issue about truth. Right. You know, the fact that her husband, she couldn't accept the fact that her husband might not be 100 percent truthful at all times. Right. I mean, who is 100 percent truthful? Right. So everyone, every I think every subgroup, every theme is looking at ideological purity. And I think what he's saying is, hey, forget it. That doesn't exist. And that's part of that other story that there's that there is no purity. I love that. I think so too. What was your thoughts, Wendy, when you yeah, first heard about you know, the movie? I watched the film a number of times and the last time I, I uh, watched it, just the other day with my husband, um, and I'm listening to the Hebrew because I know Hebrew, and I actually heard the, I heard the word Sipur Acher, which is another story in the movie. And it was the first time I uh, remembered that, but it, it happened when the two women were driving back from the cult, the night of the cult, and Anat is telling that character, I forget her name, um, okay, you know, it's not dangerous what you're doing, okay, but but it's a little extreme, like waking him up in the middle of the night and and taking him to to such a thing, like that's extreme. And and the retort was, well, what do you mean, like? didn't your parents ever take you anywhere in the middle of the night when you were a kid? And she says, ah, Zessi Poracher. That's another story. And then she challenged her and she says, why? Why is that a different story? And it was like, oh my God, that's, that's, that was a great moment because there was the title right there in that conversation. It's like, you think you're different. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're not so different. Yeah, yeah it's true. Uh, let's see, did anybody have any... Uh... Well, um, we've got a comment from um, Daniel Colick who said um, he took the other story that one story was truth and the other was lies. Hmm. That's interesting, you know, but again, whose truth? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. because that, I found that interesting, again, that the filmmaker doesn't really definitively say this is the, this is the right perspective. I thought he did a really good job trying to show the variety of perspectives. Uh, someone's asking, can we enter full screen? The movie that, that, yeah, that was an old question. I, we, I did that. I have a, I have a comment from um, my sister, Janet, who said she was okay. curious why the father's story, why, why Avi, the director, didn't go into the father's story more, in, into more detail. We don't really know what was going on over there. Yeah, well, again, that's, there, there are some, you know, critics, and I've read some reviews that do say that, because, you know, they, they felt the movie was challenged because uh, it didn't have the opportunity and the time to explore in depth our, our sort of A story. And they all, people often had that same feeling. But I think his desire to develop and, and make that B story, you know, important part of the film as well, obviously affected um, the, the, the chance to explore this further. You know, if this had been like a 
six part, you know, mini series, we would have really had a chance to see these characters and all of their complexities. Look, there was that whole story of what happened to him in New York and, you know, with his testing and all. And, and you know, we don't really ever understand what happened back there and why and what was his motivation to lie or to cheat. Because it, it does appear he actually did falsify information. He was guilty. Yeah. But why he did, it, you know, that's fascinating to me. I don't think we ever really had an explanation as to why he actually did that, do we? And um, so, yeah, I think you're right. That is, that is certainly a challenge here as well. Um, and, and as someone else says, Sandy, your truth depends on your perspective and changes during the film. Um, I also do think this whole issue, as you said, Benson, of truth, you know, and, and, and as you're saying, the truth is so, is, so, is so important here. And it's absolutely extraordinary to me because there are two really incredible scenes, you know, towards the ends of the film that just, that just blew me away. And of course, the first is when, you know, after everything has happened, and um, and and they go back to uh, that the woman's house and 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 she says very specifically to not is you know was this true you know did 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 my husband you know kidnap my son and take him you know away or was this just sort of a you know was he just you know forgot the time or you know did something terrible happen and a not lies yes right and says no nothing happened and everything's okay. Here's this woman, the whole movie we're being told is so full of truth and honesty and everything else. She lies, blatantly lies. Very interesting moment, moment, right? Very powerful moment. And if I'm not incorrect, I think that's the same scene where she hauls off and slaps her. And then and that slaps her back. And, and they start wailing on each other. It, it, it was just a fantastic, well, performances were great too. But it, I think it really was speaking to, you know, even when you think you know the truth, even when you think you're, you're the character who really represents truth, and there are moments in your life where you may not be able to say what is your truth and, and why. You know, and, and maybe that's okay. I, I don't know what, you know, you know what I mean, Benson? That's a, that's a very interesting psychological situation she got put. I mean, th there's no question, you know, just, just as like a small point, her husband, Shachar, or her future husband, Shachar, you know, what's he lying to her about? He's lying to her about an oxycotton addiction, yeah. uh, addiction, right? right? And we know what that does to people. I mean, yeah. you know, we've got like people just dying all over the place. This is, it's almost like, not even human, you, you just become taken over by this, right? So it's not even like he's consciously lying. And that's like, again, it's just a, a small kind of crumb that he drops in the film, which also locates it very much in this time. But, it, but it, I think it, it, it kind of demonstrates the fact that what is true and what is a lie and what is, what is reasonable and what is unreasonable becomes very blurred. And I think that, that final scene is where we see a not recognizing that that truth isn't absolute. And I, I think that's an important, that's an important uh, character evolution that she has. Yeah. Great moment for her. What else, Wendy? Are there some other interesting comments? We yeah, should, yeah, we, we have a couple of interesting. Uh, so Diane Sandler is saying, um, she took it this to mean that there are two sides to every story. In every situation, there's the main character's perception of what is going on. And then there's the belief system of other people around them. The husband of the young boy thinks his wife is crazy and is in a cult, but the husband is very exacting in his standards of learning for his son and takes him to the monastery, which could also be considered to be cult-like. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And then we have a, a comment from Ron. Uh, there is a wonderful line in the movie about when you have a child, you have, you have two, the hoped for child and the real one. And at some point you have to choose between them. Th that is another example of two alternate stories. Wow. Very true, very true, yeah. Yeah, well, I think again, that I, I, all these comments are great because it, it does show that people are recognizing the the complexity of the story that you know Avi was interested in telling 
and 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 why and that's you know and that's see that to me this is why you know film is so powerful and such a great medium because it really allows and not all films obviously but, but, a, but a, a director like this is able to really um, kind of you know work with you the audience and drip, bring you into a world you know introduce these characters and through emotional empathetic response to the characters you're able to start to experience these different perspectives and feelings you know people can write you know intellectual treatises on these subjects and we can analyze them psychologically in all these different ways but but then it's, it's all done with the mind right and and with a film and with film and with this film it, it's really involving your heart right because you, you really, you know, I would really care about these people. I wanted, you know, to them to find redemption or find peace at least. You know, the father and the son. I mean, it just, it just was so interesting to me how their conflict and how the father tries to get his son involved in the case so they can work together. And you know, you you just you just feel so much compassion for this father. You know, and what he's been through with his. You know, obviously his favorite granddaughter and all of this. I, I just, I just love when filmmakers really take on these kinds of subjects and and recognize the power they have to to affect us and to influence us. And, and again, I, I don't think this is a perfect film, you know, and and I don't think the reviewers actually think it's one of his best films. But I don't think that really matters. I think it's, you know, at least for me, what, and of course, I'm so sorry that I watched it on my computer or TV set. I wasn't able to watch it on the big screen the way it should have been seen because, you know, people get confused sometimes. They think, you know, oh, I, I really only need to see a film on the big screen when it has beautiful landscapes and gorgeous photography. And that's when I should go to the movie theater. But that's not actually true. The reason I like to see these films on the big screen is because then you really get to see into the, the actor's eyes. You know, you really get to see into, you know, how they're thinking, what's going on when they're not talking. You know, there's an intimacy that, that's created with, you know, in the theatrical film, you know, experience where you, you, you just get so much more information and you can get so much more subtext, right? And when you watch it on your computer, particularly while you're also trying to read subtitles at the same time, you know, um, it, it, that part, unfortunately for me, was a little challenging, but still better this way than, well, it would have been better to be showing them at the West Tail in person. Of course. Fred, I have a couple of interesting comments and a question from someone. Um, so Irwin says, since all the characters were flawed, I picked up a sense of forgiveness and reconciliation and compromise. And then he says, I also saw the two female leads were diametrically opposite. One was escaping a dysfunctional home and drugs and turns to orthodoxy, while the other was escaping repression under the ultra-orthodox life. Yeah, and, and that and, leads and, me to the question. I, I'll just ask the question, then you can comment on both. Uh, someone, Cheryl's asking, can you comment on the role the three women played? They are they are each so liberated and conflicted. But, but, but I thought again, what was so beautiful is they are liberated, they're conflicted and they're vastly different. And, and the third woman I assume we're talking about is the mother, right? Because she really brought us into a whole nother context of what Israel, Israeli life is like, you know, in her beautiful penthouse and this high powered woman and everything else. But, but uh, I thought one of the very powerful scenes is when, they both notice, oh, they both have scars on their arms. Remember that? And, and oh, so they both had, you know, really, really tried to escape their situations. And, and there was that kind of amazing recognition that, wow, you know, we are so different, but we're also really very much the same. You know, that, I thought that was, you know, maybe a little heavy handed in terms of its, you know, its, its metaphor, but it really came across very powerfully, I thought, at that time. So, so I, I agree with that comment completely, you know, and, and I think it really made a difference. And, and I do think you're right, each of these characters had their own arc, 
right? You know, you meet them at the beginning, they're very set in their, you know, perspective, they're, they know the truth, they know the way things can, should be. And then perhaps over time, they've all learning to sort of question and to recognize maybe they have to change. I mean, it's quite lovely to believe that, you know, the family that was gonna get separated and divorced, they, they, they're gonna wind up together. I think there's, there's hope in that, in that family, right? By the end, you know, and that she, you know, does recognize that there has to be a shared perspective. She can't just follow her own truth and ignore what her husband wishes. And, and maybe he's learned something too, you know, so. Uh, so many great scenes like that, I think. Uh, other questions? Anybody else have favorite scenes they want to comment on? Or what else are we hearing, Wendy? Um, Janet says, the film was disturbing in the truth. The secrets we carry and the struggle to live the lives we believe give us hope, strength, and reflect our own truth. Yeah, it is. That's very much what this is about. And, uh, and again, first, because what is my truth? You know, what is, who am I? You know, what's my identity? What do I want to bring and share to the world is, is a struggle in itself. And then even the recognition, once you think you found that, you know, how do you go about living your life? Are you going to impose that truth on everyone you meet and your beliefs and your biases? Or, or do you recognize them for what they are, which is your truth and your biases, once you even think you know what they are, which is hard enough, in a, and particularly being raised in a society in Israel, which as Benson you know, clearly indicates, there's so much diversity and so much variety. There is no like, uh, you know, expected way to, to live, right? So I think that's very, Great question, right? It really speaks to the heart of, of the movie and what the movie's, you know, talking about. Um, what I'd like to share with, with uh, viewers is something, um, a tragic turn that happened to Avi Nesher just as this film was debuting in Israel, which I think is pertinent to this conversation. Uh, you know, critics have called this his most, one of his most personal films because, um, you know, Avi Nesh has been quoted as saying, like, the things he writes about are not necessarily things that happen to him, but things that he's afraid might happen to him. And he had a very close relationship with his daughter and his son, very close family. Um, so this film debuted at the Toronto International Film Festival in the fall of 2018, I believe. And then after that, it had its debut in Israel in Haifa in September 2018. And that night, his son, his 17-year-old son, Ari, who was in the audience, Ari actually appears in the film. Um, I actually have a screen share I want to I want to do right now so people can see Avinesher's son. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. Um, Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the sun. Yeah, so that's a scene. Um, I'm just gonna make this full screen and then I'm gonna keep talking. Um, sorry, everybody, just a second. Okay. So that's Ari Nesher in the movie. He was in that scene when um, uh, Natan Goshen's character was shortly after a concert. So the night that the film premiered in Haifa, Ari Nesher, it was the first time he actually saw the whole film and he signaled to his father that night, like, like that was a fabulous film from a distance. And that night, um, I guess the family drove back to Tel Aviv together later that night and Ari went out with his friend and a few hours later, the parents get a horrible phone call. Uh, every parent's worst nightmare. He, he was on an electric bike. His friend had take him, taken him for a ride on his electric bicycle that night out on the street and they were hit. It was a hit and run. And Ari was um, fatally injured. 
and never recovered. And he died a couple of days later and um, all of Israel mourned a terrible tragedy. Um, a, a young man cut down in his prime. And this is of course, Israel such a small country and everyone felt like it was family that it had happened to them. And the family ended up donating his organs to a number of recipients so that something positive could come out of it. So um, after I watched the movie the other night, I, I, I just kind of scrolled through so I could find this shot because I knew he was in the movie. And I think this photo really captures the essence of this beautiful boy. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm trying to say is um, very shortly after, you know, th this film was had just been premiered in Israel and Avi Nesher was obligated to go to all these public events in the wake of this tragedy. And, and if you, you see the videos of him um, on Israeli YouTube uh, channels and he, he was so brave and put on a happy face and, and it was such a horrible tragedy. And, and then the following Israeli Independence Day, he was invited by the Israeli government to light a torch, Abi Nesher I'm talking about, light a torch in memory of his son. And it's a big honor to be asked to light a torch on Israeli Independence Day. And they had a YouTube video about that as well that I watched last night. And he said that, you know, it was a tremendous, awful blow to him and his family. But what he learned from this is that life is a gift and that um, you should live your life trying to do good. And that for him, the way he tries to do good is through his films. And if his films are making a positive impact, on people, then that to him is somehow his, I'm going to say tikkun. This is how he, his, mm -hmm. how he wants to live his life. And that was the lesson. So just, I felt that it's important for people to know what happened to Avi Nesher right after this film was released. So, so fascinating. And, and of course, you know, this is a man who could have been very wealthy, very successful working in Hollywood and, you know, obviously very, very talented and bright. And he chose, you know, this other path because he really had a passion and uh, a vision of what he might be able to do as an Israeli filmmaker. And and thank, thank goodness, because, you know, he really is a, a great treasure. You know, as many of you know, uh, Israel in general is just absolutely exploding with creative talent in, in cinema and in television, right? This has almost been a golden era for, for Israel. I'm not actually even sure why, if it's the fact that they have such good uh, film schools and training or or they're just great storytellers, which they've been for you know hundreds of years. But many, you know, wonderful Israeli TV series wind up being done again, right? In 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 Hollywood, like uh, you know, uh, the, the, what's what are some of the famous ones? The one uh, I just went out of my head with Claire Danes. Um, uh, the the Homeland. what Homeland. Homeland, yeah, Homeland, of course, was you know was was an Israeli miniseries first, and so um, I'd be really so I'm, I wish, unfortunately, I, there are lots of reasons why Avi couldn't be with us. But Benson, do you do you know have any insight as to what what yeah. what is behind the film and television? I know there's high tech and other things as well, but particularly you know, I, I mean, I can't. I, I'm going to draw back on my my research, which which is entrepreneurship, but I look all over the world at different cultures and. You know, Israel is a culture that, you know, it, 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 you wouldn't expect, you'd think it'd be defense oriented and very strict and militaristic. And it's actually the opposite. Everyone is their own boss. You know, it, it is the most uh, creative culture, partly because it's a culture of so many opinions and so many different opinions. And no one allows authority to dictate what it is they're going to think. So, you know, if you're an Israeli engineer, the first thing you do is throw the instructions away and start experimenting and trying things out, seeing how far you can go. That's true if you're an Israeli politician and it's true if you're an Israeli filmmaker. You know, the, they, they will throw out the conventions, they'll throw out the, the, the normal method that you're supposed to use and say, why should I listen to anyone's method? Every Israeli is their own emperor. And, and so it's a country of emperors in a way, 
and it doesn't matter where they are on the spectrum. And I think you know, you know, in certainly in terms of religiosity, this is a this is a country where people um, people have the confidence. You know, you talk the most interesting bus drivers in the world are the bus drivers in Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, everyone has an amazing story, and everyone has the view that their story is the most important one. And so they, you know, they, they take that everywhere, right? And they take that to every single environment. They take it to, you know, whether it's a NGO that they're starting or a film that they're making or a company at their beginning or, a, you know, I mean, anything. And that's why it's, it's just seething with creativity. And I, and I think that's what its biggest contribution is. We see it everywhere. So, yeah, it's not a surprise, yeah, and yeah. and it's 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 fabulous to watch. Yeah, no, I think that's so interesting. Of course, and here we go with the other story, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, it's it's almost, and I think this was a comment from uh, Daniel actually that it's uh it's not it's not the other person, it's the other story, right? So this isn't necessarily about personal conflict. It's that. As you just pointed out, people are very independent thinkers. They have their story. They take it with them everywhere they go. But maybe they don't always stop to listen to the other story, right? And, and maybe, you know, at the end of the day, that's really what this movie is trying to say, is it's not wrong to have your story. It's not wrong to follow your passion. It's not wrong for, uh, for a nod to want to do this and become strict and orthodox and everything else. He's not, he's not passing any judgment, except to the extent you recognize it's your story and not everyone else's and how it affects everyone else around you. you know? um, anyhow, so many, so many moments. So uh, what else, anybody, uh, something else, uh, comments that have come in? Um, you know, again, people talk about their forgiveness, reconciliation, compromise you know these are things that israelis probably struggle a bit with you know um, historically and and especially today and god knows you know i don't even want to start talking about politics in israel but but uh, am i correct that the orthodox uh group has a very strong role in the in the political world there and 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 not necessarily a positive one sometimes is is, is that relevant benson or yeah, there's actually this this had, had uh, uh, part of the perspective where Satamar and they're they're not Zionists. They don't even believe in in uh, the existence of Israel. So they're they're even outsiders in the ultra orthodox spectrum, right? So I mean, you have outsiders everywhere. So if you imagine in in the Haredi community, you've got outsiders, right? So I mean, and that's Israel. There's there's just this incredible spectrum. Of, of variation that and it's amazing it's amazing it's a functioning country given <laughs> yeah because even forming a coalition to actually have a government has become such a huge challenge for them yeah agree. Okay. i agree like go ahead wendy um the the movie that avi nesher made immediately before the other story is called past life and it's actually on it's either on iTunes or Amazon Prime. I recently watched it. And when past life has a Holocaust theme and it's based on a true story. And I think his idea was to do a trilogy um, on the past. Mm -hmm. So past life is, people can go look it up. Um, this one. And then apparently his next movie, which he's working on is about, um, a female, <clears throat> based on a true story of this woman who died during the 1948 War of Independence. Um, one thing we didn't talk about tonight was that um, in Avi Nesher's films, he tends to have very strong female protagonists. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite films of his is called The Secrets, um, which if if anyone has access to canopy.com k with a k you can see the secrets there it's a brilliant movie um and then in in uh turn left at the end of the world also he had very strong female protagonists. Yeah. so I, I really see avi nesher as as a feminist and uh somebody who's very um who admires women 
and and the fact that his next movie he's chosen to focus on on this woman who was a bit of an extremist she was uh it was during the war of independence and and uh the Israeli Halutzim, the pioneers were living on this kibbutz, which was about to be invaded by the Egyptian army. And um, people were told to go flee. You know, the women and children were told to go flee and the fighters would remain behind. And she refused to leave. Um, Mira, I forget her name. Um, and, and she was killed. But you could see on this YouTube video, he was interviewing all these women from that era and that he has such an affinity and an understanding of, of women and their perspective. So I, I really admire him for that. No, I think it, it's, it's just great. And, um, and also, you know, I just want to make sure everybody recognize and appreciates how much hard work that Wendy in particular and Benson have done in terms of putting this film festival together for all of you. Um, we have two more amazing films. Uh, I hope you have a chance to join us for. Leona, which is the film we're going to be um, talking about on Wednesday night. Is that still available for people to see? Yes, it is. Yeah. So this is done by a young uh, Mexican uh, Jewish director in Mexico City, contemporary film. It's his first directorial effort. And I have to say, I think it's one of the 10 best films I've seen this year. It was done for no budget. Uh, it deals with, uh, you know, themes about a, a young woman actually and, and her struggle living within the Jewish community there and very fascinating it's Syrian immigrant Jewish family you know I guess there's I don't know that much about the history of Mexico City and how this all came about but we'll talk about that on Wednesday but I want to highly recommend it because the director is joining us from Mexico City so there'll be a chance to really talk with him at length and then Thursday night is a, a picture of his life, um, which is a, actually a documentary about a very famous uh, Israeli photographer um, whose name I never pronounced properly. Can you say it for us, Wendy? Um, it's escaping me right now. Okay. Anyhow, uh, but it's also done by a director from LA who's not a documentary filmmaker. He normally does scripted drama films and he'll be joining us as well. So um, anyhow, unless anybody have anything else they want to add at this point, or I think this has been great. And thank you, Benson and Wendy for joining us. And, uh, and I hope we all see you again.